What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? This is Becoming Lion Podcast with your host, Coach Joe. Alongside, we have the Lions Den coaches, Coach Tanya, Coach Matt, joining us in on a podcast that is going to answer a lot of programming questions. We have a ton of questions here that were submitted through our Iron Lions Facebook group. We have about 2,000 members in there now, so that's been growing at a rapid rate. Great community of people who just want to come together, talk training, uh, whether you're a weightlifter, bodybuilder, strongman, powerlifter, we have it all in there. Um, But like I said, it's just a community where you guys can put your videos, we share articles, and it's been growing at a really good rate. So if you guys are interested in something that's totally free, I would say check out the Iron Lines Facebook group and uh, just join in on that and you'll see what we're talking about. But we ask these questions for them to give to us kind of turned out like I just said a lot of programming questions so I think you guys will find a lot of value in this as we as coaches get questions on programming all the time Uh, but before we get into it just remember guys this podcast is completely not monetized so I don't make any money off this podcast we are just here to spread uh, very valuable content to you guys to help you along your lifting journeys whether you're a beginner intermediate or advanced lifter whatever the heck that means Uh, at some point this uh knowledge that we are trying to share with you guys will come into handy. Uh, so just remember that. Tell a friend, family member, cat down the street, whatever, uh, and let's kick it off. But real quick, how's everybody doing? We have three cameras set up. This is like a studio grade setup we have here. So hopefully <laughs> hopefully the editing comes out all right. Um, but how's everybody doing today? Good. I'm doing good. There's like some low-key interrogation vibes going on right now. It's yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What did you do with my barbell? <laughs> uh, no, but uh, it's pretty cool. So I'm trying to up the production quality for the podcast. So the next thing we'll have is just better sound quality going on in here. Um, and if you guys didn't know, you can't hear the buzzing noise from the fluorescent lights. So that's a big one because we got some noise complaints on that. Um, but uh, yeah, so are you guys training for anything? What do we got going on uh, with training? How's it going? Training's going good. Um, I'm going to be doing a powerlifting meet in the, I guess, late winter of 2020. So I'll be starting my training block for that soon, fairly Probably, soon. Yeah, for, fairly mm-hmm. soon. What's your favorite lift out of the bench squat or deadlift? Probably right now with the way I'm feeling, I would say squat. Nice, yeah, you do like to squat. I do. For sure. Um, Matt, what's going on with you, man? Um, got winter wreckage coming up. So that's a strong man comp coming up at the Lions Den. That's December 14th. And also be hopping in on that powerlifting meet, so that'll be my first powerlifting meet. Yeah, right. Um, so that should be interesting. Might pull out the sumo deadlift, not sure yet. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> about yeah. that. What would you say your favorite lift is? Uh, squat, definitely, 100%. Well, yeah. that's just because I, like, squatted forever when I first started. And it was, like, all squats, and I, like, rarely ever deadlifted. So my squat's just way better than mine. Uh, yeah, it's very similar to mine. Yeah. I, was t- I was telling Don that today. I was like... I've been having these crazy big jumps in my deadlift just because it was super under-trained. Like, now it's all catching up where it's, like, you know, 10-pound PR, 15 or something like that. Before, it was, like, I went from 600 to, like, 650, and the newbie gains are now diminishing. Mm -hmm. Um, But what's cool is I think we all started squatting, and I think uh, a lot of people neglect the squat, especially with that, like, bro mentality of, I don't want to, you know, hit the legs, but there's a lot of value in doing that. But anyway, so... We're going to hop right into these questions because I want to give you guys just answers to these questions and just keep the content rolling. Um, Like I said, most of them are programming questions, and then there's some miscellaneous questions that we have in there, but we'll kind of let everybody give their take on uh, each of these questions, let the conversation go on as it shall, and uh, hopefully you guys find some value out of this. So first question is uh, how to go about programming for guys over 50. Does anybody want to take that question and just give any feedback okay. Okay. yeah um so my first thing is if you're a perfectly healthy guy over 50 i'm probably not going to do anything different for programming for you we actually had a dude coming through our program i think and he was like a over 50 year old trying to be more competitive mm-hmm. um yeah the program is going to be normal for you the, the thing i will say is like sometimes if you've been in the lifting game for a long period of time joints might be beat up um i was telling joe we had this one guy at my gym before the lion's den where he'd basically be wrapping up every single joint on his body uh, before he lifted and at that point it's like maybe it's time to look at training uh changing things up and going more like the hypertrophy route uh, just taking a little bit of stress off the joints mm-hmm. but if you're perfectly healthy yeah it's going to be normal programming what about you tanya yeah i i wrote down the same thing um it kind of i kind of face that with a lot of the you know girls here at the gym 
um, because we are different age brackets and we all train the same. Mm -hmm. So I think if you don't, like Matt said, if you don't have any injuries or things that are holding you back, you shouldn't even focus on your age. Age is just a number. Go for how you feel and keep pushing yourself till you can. Yeah, I was kind of piggyback off what Matt said. Maybe if they've been training for a long time, um, they may have an increase in their frequency or volume, just in terms of like a programming Mm -hmm. standpoint. So uh, I think it was through either Stronger by Science or Barbell Medicine talking about the older people get, the higher their frequency should be and their volume, which is kind of the same for anybody, obviously. Like you're gonna need to up the dose um, the, the longer you've been in the game, but kind of we would all agree that we would program for you the same as we would anybody else, just kind of like we talked about in the one podcast, girls don't train differently than guys, mm-hmm. kind of falls in line with that same uh, mm-hmm. principle. So um, I like this one, this this one could go into many different uh, avenues, but a long-term uh, prep, as in several months, what should be the priorities? Um, so this kind of piggybacks off actually the second one where it has the next question would be what are some training strategy cycles, blocks, high volume, low volume, frequency? So this is just like in general, how would we structure a program? So if anybody wants to take that one away, we can just piggyback off of it. But I first would say uh, we you'd have to establish what are the goals of this person? Oh, so, right. so before we even get into it, you mm-hmm. have to figure out, well, what are your goals? Do you want to be a power lifter? Do you have a strongman competition coming up? Uh, are you a bodybuilder? These are questions that you are going to have to ask yourself. Um, but maybe why don't we take them through how it would kind of run for just a stereotypical strength and conditioning to leading up to some sort of test. Uh, and let's say the test is just going to be in the big compound lifts just to kind of keep it a general base of that so if anybody wants to kick it off with their thoughts on how they would go about that or how we handle our clients the online clients that we handle and the programs that we put out yeah um so we're talking uh i'll just start with like a 12-week program instead of like a year-long uh training cycle uh we're talking like a 12-week program uh you'll usually split that up into four-week blocks and if we're just trying to get you to that single in that 12 weeks you'll usually see you know a lot of your volume towards that beginning of the program so that could be volume in terms of you know sets of eight depending on what you're going for in powerlifting terms you'll usually see it towards the sets of five so the classic fives Um, Ah. (laughs) but then uh, as you're going on it's going to taper itself down so that first block will be your building block going to be a ton of volume you might see up to you know six sets sometimes of just straight volume getting you prepped Uh, that middle block will be kind of your volume mixed in with that intensity. So you might see your reps going down, but the volume is still staying you know, relatively high. Uh, and then towards that ending block is when you're getting into those more specific, maybe the threes, even the doubles, uh, towards that single. You're just kind of peaking up towards that single. Um, the other thing we'll sometimes do is add singles into the program. And you can do that very from the, the get-go, depending on your trainee. Uh, it can be mentally taxing sometimes. Mm-hmm. I personally like to add it in kind of towards the second half. Uh, just so I'm not like freaking out about singles yeah. the entire part of the program, but it is perfectly fine to do it for the whole program. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I would totally agree. I, I would say you, just to clarify, you want some sort of progressive overload, uh, and you should see a difference from when you start to when you end. Uh, if the end goal is some sort of test, like you don't want to be doing high volume all the way until the testing point, uh, because that's just going to cause fatigue. Now, to add in on top of that, we use what's called low stress weeks. So this may be. Four weeks in, six weeks in, you're accumulating all of this stress on your body and you're going to need to have some sort of rest or recovery. Now, typically for a deload period, what uh, we've seen a lot in the past and I've been guilty of it is I just take a week off. Um, And that may work for you, uh, but what we would suggest is a low stress week where you're actually still lifting throughout that time period. And often it's going to be a higher intensity. You're just reducing the volume because the volume is what's going to fatigue you. So say you're doing four sets of 10, that's 40 reps. Maybe you're just going to do um, you know, uh, a couple sets of six or eight reps and no back offs. So we're just reducing that volume, uh, and keeping the intensity so high. So we're lifting and, um, personal anecdote on this whole thing is competing wise. Uh, I like it because I'm still using, uh, my lifts in competition or the implements and specifically talking about strongman, or if I take a week off, say you take a week off from doing a circus mm-hmm. dumbbell, I feel like it may not be a huge difference, but I feel like in the back of my mind, I may not be as confident yeah. as if I was yeah. if I didn't take that week off. Um, so with your program, it kind of says right here, what would be the priorities? Specificity is always going to be king. 
Uh, and if you're going to compete in a powerlifting competition, you should be focusing on the powerlifting movements and their variations. You shouldn't be getting involved with uh, doing a lot of strongman things or maybe throwing in tons of volume and bodybuilding and, and isolation movements. Uh, and take the flip side around, if you're doing a strongman competition, you shouldn't be wasting a ton of time, uh, let's say, focusing on increasing your squat if there's going to be no squat event in the competition. Uh, so you have to write down, yet again, this is a very you know, nuanced topic, um, but what are the goals? And then writing that program out to lead up to those goals or that test and not dabble in a bunch of uh, things that wouldn't necessarily be in line with your goals. Mm. I was going to say you could even break them down like kind of how like a strongman program would work, like how you do get specific to, mm -hmm. you know, that might kind of help. Yeah, so how we program for the athletes uh, with strongman is, and, and the, we get this question a lot too, is how do you program strongman in a typical right. uh, program? And it's very simple because a lot of the strongman implements can just be swapped for a normal move, or movement. So say you have an overhead press, but in your competition you have a log clean and press. Well, instead of that overhead press slot, it's gonna be a log clean and press. Or maybe your deadlift is an axle bar deadlift. Very simple switch for your comp deadlift day or your deadlifting day in general. You switch that to an axle bar. Um, and as you get closer, you start throwing in more uh, specific movements tailored to that competition and event work. Uh, normally for myself and my clients that are far out, like we're talking 16, 12 weeks, we don't really do too many events. Um, we have some of the basic movements, but I'm not having them every week run through their events because we're very far out. So what I'd rather have them do is put more time into getting stronger in those main movements or the, the, the specific lifts uh, in a competition versus the actual event, if that makes sense. And the thing I'll add about a uh, specificity this is something I was guilty of when I was first making programs is uh, you do kind of have to narrow down your goals. You can't kind of accomplish everything on one program alone. Mm -hmm. uh, and something I'd always do is I'd frustrated because I'd look at the programs like, well, I want to build muscle and I want to get real strong in the squat bench and deadlift, but I also want to lose weight, but no <laughs> program has that. So I'm yeah. going to build my own. And there's a reason those programs don't exist. Uh, getting through all of those goals on one program is basically impossible to do since a lot of the goals have alternate adaptations they need. Um, so the stress you're gonna to need to apply to get a really strong squat versus the stress you're gonna to need to apply to get really big legs is gonna be two different, uh, two different ranges there, so. Absolutely. Uh, and then on the, the end of this question, it said um, hypertrophy phases. So when typically I'm programming for an athlete or a client, um, we lead up to the competition and we have that competition. Now say there's gonna be some off time, maybe they won't compete for several months uh, down the road, uh, after that, I'll do typically what's like a washout block. So that is going to be throwing a totally novel stimulus into their training. So maybe they've always pulled conventional. This may be a time where we spend a month working on sumo deadlifts, or maybe we're working on our GPP. So doing more athletic movements, power clean, snatches, something very different for them to kind of just like the name states itself, wash everything out, give them something different. Uh, it's good for the body and I think the mind mentally. 100%. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was going to say mentally. It's if you've good. been putting a prep in for you know, yeah. that much time, you're gonna need something different. It gets monotonous. Yeah, and we're in it for the long term. Um, but then maybe following that, we may do a higher volume like Matt had talked about earlier, and that would quote unquote be a hypertrophy block uh, that would just have more volume in there to create more stress and, and get the muscle bigger in size in general, which mm -hmm. ultimately would make us stronger. Um, so next question, kind of we, we kind of clarified this, but we'll, we can go through real quick. When training for a strongman competition, how many weeks on a program do you give yourself? So maybe we'll go around, we can start with Coach Tanya. How many weeks would you like to have uh, in advance for a prep for any competition? Um, well, I, I'm probably like, like to be overly prepared. That's just the nature of me. So I would say I'm probably, I would like longer time to make sure I'm good to go. So I would say 16. 16 weeks? Not, Not that I feel like it's, you have to, it just would be more, I think it's sometimes personality and like, and it's maybe if it's like something you've never done, you want to feel like overly prepared. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you've done a competition, you realize, okay, like next time go around, I don't need as much time to prepare. Yeah, for so. sure. Yeah, if you're trying to be real serious with it, I'd say, you know, 12 weeks is probably your minimum prep time that you want there. Uh, you can definitely hop into these things if you're just trying to have fun, but really looking to be real competitive 12 weeks. Um, and the only thing I'd say is you have more time to work with, you're just kind of less specific the more time you have to work with. So what we'll do for uh, strongman programming is it's big focus on the deadlift and the overhead press. Um, so say you had like 20 weeks to work with, those first eight weeks could just be building up the deadlift and overhead press. Then once you get to that 12 weeks, you get more specific with it. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with them. 
the more time to prep often is going to be better, especially if it's a bigger competition uh, where, you know, you really need to focus in on it. But at the same time, we have people, we literally had a guy in our gym the other day see that we posted mm -hmm. uh, a strongman yeah. competition. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, all right, I'm doing it just for fun. Signs yeah. up, no training or experience, whatever. Um, so it all comes down to, you know, each individual. But I would say 12 weeks and minimally uh, for someone who wants to actually be competitive and see the progress in their programming and training. All right, next one. Should you incorporate Olympic lifting into power thing routines or is it the amount of time spent learning the technique better doing assistance exercise, thank you. Uh, so with this question, I think there's a way that you can do both, um, but it really depends on if you wanna make leaps and bounds in one versus the other. So if you wanna be a power lifter, you should focus on power lifting with a secondary and maybe doing some Olympic lifting work, you know, technique work with a barbell, some plates, doing some, some drills just to get acclimated to the movement. Um, but on the flip side, if you want to be a weightlifter, you need to be doing a lot more weightlifting and kind of put the powerlifting uh, secondary or more of an off-season uh, type of sport. So I, I've really fallen in love with looking at things in seasons because I think it just helps mentally break it up where I know, okay, month, you know, from one to two is when I'm just going to focus on all strongman competing during that time, you know, and then once that season's done, I'm going to go into more of, you know, weightlifting, powerlifting type stuff. Uh, but kind of like we talked about earlier, if you want to get specific, you got to mainly focus in on that. I think for doing the clean and jerk and the snatch, um, I think it's good to just learn the movement in parts, put it together, and then focus in on certain exercises to help you in certain portions of the lift. Uh, but I wouldn't just say to get to understand the clean, you just have to work on hand cleans all the time. You're going to have to learn from the ground up. Uh, the entire movement and whenever I coach it there's a video I did with coach Matt we kind of broke it up into parts of the movement but the whole time we're actually doing the full range of motion throughout the practice kind of just getting ingrained um, neurologically you know putting the mind and the body together and then from then on if I said okay Matt really needs to work on his second pull we would work on exercises that are going to help him from a second pull maybe from blocks or something similar to how we program for a deadlift uh, bench or squat and their variations guys can add into anything else you want on that one yeah so i'll just lead off with i've not done olympic weightlifting the only olympic weightlifting is what joe just mentioned is one <laughs> video with joe um but it is something i kind of believe shouldn't really be you know mm -hmm. half-assed um it does take a whole bunch of time it's one of the most technique oriented yes. lifts uh and it takes people a while to learn them mm -hmm. uh, so if you're doing them on the side it's going to be frustratingly slow progress and then it could be getting in the way of progress in the other areas that you want to see go up. So kind of combining it with other things can be done. It's just like, it's going to be frustrating. It's going to be slow. Mm -hmm. I think I've given it a, a unrealistic image because I can do both. But I think what people didn't see is the years that I put into yeah, Olympic lifting. Yeah, and that's all your focus was. Yeah, and, and just strength training in general. Like, I wasn't trying to actually do both at the same time. Right. I would say there's a, maybe a time when I knew you and we were kind of doing both. Yeah. But at the same time, it's kind of just more fun. Like, we weren't trying to compete in anything. Right. Um, so I would say for you guys, like, figure out those goals. Stick with those goals and understand if you're trying to do both. It's just like CrossFit, right? The The – when you look at a CrossFit athlete, they're good at a lot of things overall, right. but they don't excel like crazy in one. And right. that, that, that uh, line of growth is going to be a lot slower right. because they're trying to do everything right. versus just get strong or, or just get endurance, mm -hmm. et cetera. But if you do really like, if you are like a seasoned Olympic lifter and you get into powerlifting, you can always do some of those lifts in like, you know, finishers and stuff like that, but just keep the weight. Like if you just like to, you know, move a barbell in cleans and snatches, you can do that. But like, just maybe do it on your off day and like keep it lighter, mm -hmm. do conditioning and just have fun with it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. For sure. I think with the Olympic lifts, like Matt said, you, you want to put enough time to really focus mm -hmm. in on the movement um, or the weight should be light enough where you don't have to worry about that right. uh, to, to get through it. Uh, so Another tip, what advice can you give to a beginner benchers? Uh, so benching specifically, having a plateau on their bench. Anybody free for all, take away what you want. Uh, it's probably easier to fix than you think. Uh, so the first thing I'd say is uh, you could just be underweight. Uh, I know a big thing with me was uh, I was 5'11 and like 160 pounds and I thought I just sucked at bench press. I just had no weight on my frame compared to like what height I was. Um, so bench is a very uh, weight dependent lift. If you gain weight, 
you're going to gain weight on your bench press. It's just how it's going to be. Uh, the other thing is just frequency. You'll hear me, Joe, say this for basically every single lift. But bench is one of those ones that, personally for me, I could probably do like four or five days a week and be completely fine. That might not be the case for everyone. Start with you know two times a week, move up three times a week. Um, but bench is one of those ones you can kind of pound at and uh, really make some progress in. So mm -hmm. possibly look at gaining some weight. Um, if you're trying to hold on to some abs, maybe those are two conflicting goals you have. Um, and then just get more frequent with it. And then, Tiny, you've been uh, trying to increase your bench for a while. Mm -hmm. And you have. I think it's mm -hmm. went from like 125 to 155. So that's mm -hmm. 30 pound increase. So, what are, were some of the tips that you've implemented in your program that helped with your bench? Um, well, I think you have to, sometimes you plateau because you kind of, um, you know, you might have like a weak point in your bench. So, for me, it was working that spot. Like, I would always, my lift would always break down, you know, on my chest. So, um, I think you have to kind of figure out where your weak spot is and then, you know, really train that so that when you do go to try to increase the weights, you're stronger in that spot. So I think that's what the bottom line was for me that really helped. Mm -hmm. And kind of like Matt said, I think uh, we all probably started benching like once a week and then gradually increased the frequency. I know Tanya started it once a week mm -hmm. uh, and then she got to three times a week. And one of those days, obviously, she's working on her weak point in that lift specifically to get through that sticky point. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's kind of how we would address almost any other lift as well. If you have an issue with whatever lift, that's, that's kind of how we would go about fixing that lift. Um, this one, what are your opinions on 531? What is BBB? What is it? Boring but, but big. big. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's a that's a like a program. Yeah, it's a gym. It's like the OG Jim Wendler five three one program. See, I don't even. <laughs> I'm not. I don't even know this. Um, uh, RP doesn't really work for me, so I prefer percentages. Okay. So uh, I think with five three one, we were talking about this earlier, and this is a short little story. I had a guy in here who ran five three one all the time, and he kept getting mad at himself. And he'd sit there and be like, I suck. Like, why Why can't, am I not getting better? Over and over and over again. And he would just always keep repeating 531. And I thought to myself, like, why doesn't this guy just switch the program up? <laughs> uh, and I think any program is fine until it doesn't work. And there's always that time where you can retry it one more time. And but I think at some point you have to look at yourself and say, okay, is it me or is it the program? And one thing with 531 is... If you keep running it, your body gets used to it, and the volume or the dose you're getting is, isn't going to be high enough to give you that stress or uh, strength adaptation. So uh, if you find that you're doing it and it's not working, I would say you need to increase the volume somehow, whether it's modifying the program to do that uh, or you know changing it to a different program completely. And I think that's the number one thing people will say about 531 is the volume no longer is enough. Uh, for them to get the results that they want compared to other programs out there. So if it's not working for you, that would be my suggestion. Increase the volume, the frequency of the lifts, uh, try a different program out. Yeah, I think it's become like a almost internet meme at this point in the fitness community that 531 is just low on frequency. Um, but there are people that have literally fixed the 531, so there's like a thousand variants of it right now. So if it's not working anymore, just look up on the internet one of those variants and you'll probably be good to go. The 531 boring but big is pretty low frequency, it does not have a lot of volume. So if you're new to lifting, it'll probably work out. Um, but like Joe said, once it stops working, switch things up or just look for one of those variants that someone has modified it because um, again everyone loves 531 people have modified the death out of it so just look for one of those yeah and we actually have used 531 here for the athletes who are just getting into lifting and it worked really well for mm -hmm. a large you know majority of people uh, and then we started seeing that they weren't progressing and then we just switched it up yeah. Um, but yeah I'm not here to hate on 531 obviously it's worked for a lot of people or it wouldn't right. be as big as it is mm -hmm. uh, I just think you have to understand like when it's time to change and also don't beat yourself up continually thinking that you're at fault if you're putting in the work and you are training hard and there's a, a whole other side of that if you're not training hard you need yeah. to have a reality check with yourself but if you're honest with yourself you've run it multiple times there are other programs out there that you should try uh, to kind of get you through that plateau. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we'll do this question and then I'm going to restart the cameras. But uh, this is RPE does the same thing, but RPE doesn't really work for me, so I prefer mm -hmm. percentages. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Tony, maybe you want to? Well, I think we were discussing this earlier. Um, I think, you know, RPE, it is a, it's hard at first. Um, it does take 
some time, I think, just to kind of um, be honest with yourself, like when you truly ask a question like, okay, if it's an RP6, like, do I really know how many more I could have done? So I think it takes time to kind of like, but you, I mean, honestly, you always have a number in your head just because, I mean, that's kind of how it works. But I think um, RP takes time and it does kind of, you have to kind of figure out like, how are you really pushing yourself? Um, and I think, you know, when you're patient, give it time. I think it, it does really work. And for me, I've really liked it just because on those days when I'm like, if I would have been playing the percent game and I, my body was just not feeling it, there's not so much like of that, like hardcore stress on yourself and beating yourself up. So, um, I think for me, like, I think RP's, you know, been great. Um, so I would say for those people that are new to it, it does take time. So just kind of like give yourself time to kind of get used to it. But keep um, track, too, so you can kind of, like, write notes to yourself, and that kind of helps you learn um, yourself and how you're feeling and, you know, why you maybe felt a certain week better than others. And so we can help you progress that way. Yeah. Um, RP, what Tanya said, frustrating to learn at first. Uh, and what she also just said, uh, definitely write down all your lifts and always give it a grade of what RP you thought it was. Uh, even if you don't really know, and you'll just get progressively better at it. I think people are looking for like an objective perfect, yes, that was RPE8. Uh, you're not gonna reach that point, even us as coaches, we mm -hmm. don't really have that point. We have a, that was probably RPE8. Um, and that's just kind of what you leave it at. In terms of percentages, I think you're gonna see that die out a little bit. It's gonna get more rare. RP from like a coach's standpoint is perfect because even if the person doesn't have one rep maxes, we can still give them a training program. Um, so just from like an ease of building programs, you're probably gonna see percentages die out. But as like a logical progression guy, I totally agree with you. I love percentage-based programs. Mm -hmm. I just haven't run one in a while. Um, and I like running them when I know exactly what my one rep maxes are because then the percentage program will work out perfectly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's just something you have to give more time uh, I really like using it from a coaching perspective and standpoint, like Matt said. And uh, with percentages, it is awesome because you know exactly how much weight to put on the bar. Um, at the same time, it kind of holds you back on days that you probably could have uh, pushed yourself. And, you know, maybe that stress long term is going to help give you the adaptation that you want. But like I said, for either you're holding yourself back or um, you're maybe overdoing it. So that's why we like using RP. But in the perfect situation, like us as coaches, we actually use both. So we use RPE, and then typically we'll gauge off our volume with percentages. So I think uh, if you can, you know, learn RPE and then see how percentage works into the game, uh, it's just a perfect little uh, couple that you have going on there.